Good morning. It's so good to see you today. And uh, for those of you who are joining us online, we're always thrilled uh, to know that you're taking time out of your day, wherever you are, to participate. And I can tell you that online is good, but I also think on campus is even better. What do you think? Yeah. So for, if you're watching, you're welcome. Like we would just let you know, you're always welcome here. I did want to make you aware uh, uh, the numbers regarding COVID are doing really well. How many are glad things are starting to feel more normal? Yeah, yeah. So when we get to the Easter weekend, you know we still have some spots that are designated as socially distanced seating. Those, uh, as long as numbers in our county stay down, those uh, spots will become regular seating when we get to Easter weekend. Uh, we're in a series on uh, in Genesis, and today we're going to talk about temptation and sin. Aren't you glad you came? <laughs> yeah. Well, look at it this way. Maybe we'll talk about someone else's temptation and their sin, and then you'll feel better. In Genesis 3, it says, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? So why is this story in scripture? Is it a cautionary tale to avoid talking snakes? Um, I, th I think we should just avoid snakes whether they talk or not. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> uh, is, it a, is it a warning against uh, uh, gaining too much knowledge? Is it a concern about how much fruit you eat? Uh, I think this story is actually far more than a warning. I think it's a diagnostic. I think it actually goes underneath the things that can happen in our hearts and in our minds and gives us a picture of what's actually going on. It's not just a voyeuristic indulgence into someone else's sin. We do this all the time in our culture. Some important celebrity, politician, someone who's well-known steps outside of bounds and, and everybody wants to know all the details and anyone who has any details is automatically given camera time and talk time. That's not what's going on here. I do think that this story can save us a lot of grief and actually help us recover from our failures in life. I think it's, it's a super valuable story. So let's start with this concept. We are not all tempted by the same things, but we're all tempted by something. Uh, let's see, anybody here eat tofu? There's a way in the back, yes. Uh, you can't tempt me with tofu. <laughs> You can try, but you'd have to find another way to tempt me. You'd have to tempt me with a brand new car. That's what that would take. No, uh, we're, we're all tempted by something, and that temptation usually shows up. For example, we may be tempted to act in ways that benefit us, but it's actually at the cost of someone else. We may be tempted to consume something that tastes good or makes us feel good, but can have long-term health consequences. We may be tempted to look better than we actually are in an academic setting 
or maybe in an occupational setting, or maybe in a financial setting. But the cost is, is that we're not actually prepared when we have to step up and act with responsibility. We're not prepared for that moment. We may be tempted to act better than we are emotionally. Uh, but the cost to that is that we can undermine our own stability or the stability of relationships that we engage in. Here's the thing about temptation that's worth knowing. And that is that we're only tempted by something we already want. We're only tempted by something that we already want. James, the first chapter, puts it this way. When tempted, because the assumption is you will be, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. That's useful information right there. You will be tempted, but it won't be by God, because he cannot be tempted himself, and he doesn't tempt anyone anyone else. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Now, here's the thing about desires. They're not all evil, and they're not all sinful. And Christianity does not actually call for us to eliminate our desires. There are some religions that call for that. They believe that desire is the source of all sin in the world. And if you can eliminate desire, you will eliminate sin. But Scripture and Christianity doesn't call us to try to get rid of our desires. It calls us to control our actions. That's a very different thing. Uh, we can want really good things for not really good reasons. Some of I just want good things. We can want good things, but not for really good reasons. We, we can have unhealthy motives that underlie. So, so um, it, it's not always wise to trust our desires because our desires are, are not a good decision maker. They're not a good determiner of what's healthy or unhealthy for us. Our desires actually won't purify our motives. People want to be in a relationship, right? That's good. What could be wrong about wanting that? But they might pretend to be someone that they're not in order to get into a relationship. That's not good. They might say things to sabotage a relationship another person is already in so that they can move into that vacant space. That's not good. They might want to use a person in order to gain access to someone or something else. That's not good. A single person might actually be afraid of losing a relationship if they don't do or satisfy the, the sexual appetite of the person that they are with. That's not good. A person is willing to violate their values or manipulate someone else. It's not good. A person may allow another person to take advantage of them, to become their casualty. And they think, I, I do it because I love this person so much. Thinking you are nothing is not love. That is not a good strategy. Our motives actually matter. So we learn in this story that every sin begins when we believe a lie. So the lie might be something we tell ourselves. It might be something we tell others. It might be something that someone else tells us. Uh, we might say something like this, it'll only happen one time. Hmm. Or, it's not hurting anyone else, it's not that big a deal. Hmm. Um, I heard a, a piece on a uh, interview yesterday that was quite startling and as a pastor a little bit concerning. There's a person who's built a business model out of being a confessor for people. He goes to their funerals and then he stands up and says what the person wanted them to confess, the person who died. 
This is something the person feels like they didn't communicate while they were alive, and now they want it to be said out loud. And to be sure, there are people who want to acknowledge their love, their devotion, their appreciation for support, and all of those things. But a lot of the things that this person confesses on behalf of those who have died are deep, dark secrets and deep, dark desires. And you can imagine how unsettling that would be. And I have no doubt that the person, while they were alive, because they kept it a secret, felt like no one was hurt. But if it wasn't a big deal, why can't you talk about it? That's a really big thing to think about. So all of these are lies, but it's not the biggest lie that we're all tempted to believe. The biggest lie that we're all tempted to believe is that God doesn't have your best interest at heart. The big lie is that God is actually withholding something from you for unhealthy reasons. Some people think that the serpent's lie was that, that if the man and the woman ate the fruit from the tree, that they would become like God. But the problem with believing that that was the lie is that that's not what Scripture actually says. In, in uh, Genesis chapter 3, down in verse 22, the Lord God said, listen to this, now the man, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So that wasn't a lie. What was going on? Why would God care if Adam and Eve had the knowledge of good and evil? The problem is how humans use that knowledge of good and evil. Once you know what you are afraid of, you know how to scare someone else. Once you know what hurts you, you know how to hurt someone else. Once you know what embarrasses you, you know how to embarrass someone else. Once you know what shame feels like, you know how to impose it on someone else. Humans don't have the purity of motive, the purity of heart, or the strength of character to bear that knowledge. God does. God has the knowledge of good and evil, but his motives are always pure. He's not tempted by impure motives. God understands that, that what, it, what happens when people experience certain things, and he doesn't use that against anyone. He's completely pure in his motives, and his character is uncompromising and unwavering. God has all knowledge, but he also has all wisdom. And knowledge and wisdom are not the same thing. Wisdom uses knowledge so that everyone benefits instead of just one person benefits. Wisdom doesn't put people in situations that they're not prepared for. When I was 12 years old, I wanted to drive a car. Anybody else? Yeah. And my dad was, was pretty, pretty serious about that. He would not give me the keys to the car. Why? Because I didn't really want it? Oh, I assure you I did. It's because I wasn't ready for it. Our country doesn't allow 14-year-olds to serve in the military. Why do you think that is? Because they're not ready for that. We don't leave some decisions to people who are not prepared for what is going to happen. Wisdom doesn't just follow our desires. Wisdom follows truth. It follows guidance. This is a really important concept. So the serpent comes and he asserts that eating the fruit will not cause death. You will not surely die. In fact, you'll be more alive than you've ever been in your whole life. Death wasn't instant, but it was inevitable. And rejecting God's guidance had some profound effects in their relationship. For example, before then, Adam and Eve, they were both naked and unashamed. After partaking of the fruit, all of a sudden, they started grabbing fig leaves and twisting them together and making aprons to try to hide their nakedness. What changed? Same people, same 
bodies, same garden, only now they don't feel comfortable. What happened? The serpent asserts that eating the fruit will not cause death, but that's actually not what happened. Something began to die instantly in their relationship. God comes in the cool of the day to call for Adam and Eve. He had done so every day. They had shared fellowship. They had walked together. They had talked together. Now God comes, and what does Adam and Eve do? They ran and they hid. What changed? Same God, same people, same garden, what changed? Adam and Eve didn't take responsibility for their actions when asked if they had done something. Rather than just saying, yes, I did, and I'm sorry, what they said was, that person or that creature is responsible for my behavior, and they began to blame. Death entered their self-awareness. Death entered their relationship with each other. Death entered their spiritual life with God, and the effects were profound. Their bodies didn't disintegrate to dust in a movie like, a, like in a science fiction movie. Their bodies were still there. Their hearts were still beating. Their lungs were still breathing, but the profound changes were so great that now they had to hide from each other and run from God. How can we say it doesn't matter? Just look at how much it affected them in, in, in a single moment. The lie we're tempted to believe is that God wants to limit our lives. And that's not what God's heart is. He wants us to experience life to the full. He doesn't withhold good things from us. He, some people think, well, he just wants to keep good things to himself or he wants to keep good things for people that he likes better than me. He's actually playing favorites. He wants to take advantage of me so someone else benefits. And that's not true. But because there's death and there's sin and our own self-awareness and our perception of this world, that's the kinds of thoughts that we'll think. So why, why did Adam and Eve want this knowledge? Because God had it and they wanted to be like God. The, the, the challenge is not that they were inspired to learn something that they didn't know or to be like someone that they admired. There's a little twist in here. They don't just want to be like God. They want to take the place of God. They want to decide what's right for themselves. Don't we want to do that? We want to establish what the rules should be for our lives, what the boundaries should be, what the guidelines should be. I'll decide for myself. That's kind of the mantra of modern culture in America. And lots of people throw off the idea of God, not because it doesn't make sense and not because it's not a rational view of how everything came to be. They just don't want to be restricted in any way. They don't want to be told that if there's something that they enjoy, it should be regulated in any way, or there's some things that should be considered off limits. Or there might even be some things that we should do that we don't particularly like. We don't want to be tied down. We don't want to be limited. We don't want to do things we don't enjoy, and we don't want to have regulation on the things that we do enjoy. And so we want to make our own rules. So what happens? It inflicts damage on other people. When we make rules, there's missing information. We lack the wisdom. And all of a sudden, other people are experiencing the pain that goes with it. A marriage is fractured because someone wanted to know what it was like to be with someone else or to become someone else while they were with them. Resources can be used on mind-altering substances and on virtual realities. Why? Because we're bored. The greatest sin, the two greatest sins of American culture is to be bored and to be naive. We don't want to be either one. Boredom can lead to the incredible potential of creativity. Most of the great inventions in art came out of someone being bored, and then they did something that mattered. Of course, we can always do something that just distracts us from our boredom. Guess which one our culture does more of. So I, you might be hearing you go, oh, <laughs> thank God. 
I am so grateful he's on those people. Those, those, those people, they don't follow the rules. And I, I, I follow the rules. I drive the speed limit. I do what my doctor tells me. I pay my taxes. Yeah, I wish I could tell you that everyone who follows the rules is following, following the rules in order to please God. Some of us are not trying to please God with our rule following. Some of us are trying to control God with our rule following. If I do these things, then you owe me. You have to make these things happen in my life. I can tell you, you'll find out why you're following God when you don't get what you want. That's when the light starts coming on. We find out what is our real God when we don't get what we want. So God created people to be loving and to be generous and to be fully accepting in relationship. And he created them to do work together that actually matters, can make a difference in our world. And he created them to connect with him and to enjoy his presence. He created them to enjoy good things and to avoid unhealthy things. But humans have consistently made their own choice. I always am tempted to look back in Adam and Eve and just be annoyed with them. Anybody else? It was paradise, people. It was paradise. You had one rule, one tree. It's not like even Ten Commandments. One rule, and you screwed it up. And now look at the world. You know what? That's true. <laughs> but you know what else? Our world isn't just screwed up because of their sin. It's screwed up because of our sins. The time when we reject the guidance of God because our desire overrides it. And that's why this next part of the story is so important. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. And that is God pursues us. Adam and Eve didn't seek God out as soon as they'd made a mistake. When they heard his voice, they ran away. When they were confronted, they didn't just confess what had happened. They resorted to blame, put the responsibility on someone else. When God sent his son into our world, he was pursuing us. Listen to what Jesus said of why he was here. I have come to seek and to save the lost. He's come that we might have life to the full. Our perception is, is that when God pursues us, it's just for us to pay the price for the out-of-bounds behavior we've engaged in. And this is what he does with his son. He says, I'll pay the price for your out-of-bounds behavior. So there was another garden, not Eden. It was a garden where Jesus would spend his last evening as a free person and in prayer. It was called Gethsemane. And there was another tree, not one that produced fruit that was desirable to the eyes and would give you lots of knowledge that you thought would make you wise. But a cross, and partaking of that fruit, drinking of that cup, that was going to be brutal. It was going to be torturous. It was going to be the kind of thing that no human being would ever want to go through. And Jesus actually prays the prayer. You can hear his desire. He's bringing his desire to his Father. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. This is not what I want. But in this garden, someone makes a different choice. He says it, not what I want, what you want. And what looked like death became eternal life. And not just for one, but for many. 
what looked like death became eternal life. Would you bow your heads? I wish I could tell you that successfully navigating temptation gets noticed often. It's not noticed at all. The only one who knows is you and God. Yet there's a kind of hopeful, uh, wholeness and fruitfulness in a life that is willing to bring your desires to God and say, this is what desire is true of me, but what I need is your guidance. I'll honor what you say. And I can tell you that following the guidance of God is not likely to make you popular, but it will make you reliable. It won't make you famous. It will make you faithful. So Father, right now, in our own heart, we call up the desire that exercises a lot of control over the decisions that we make. And we bring it to you. We want you to know what our desire is, but we want to know what your desire for us is too. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.